We thank the Lord for the week that it has been. And uh, last week we began on something that, a topic that I called the 12 imperatives of power and influence. And the foundation of that is that the Bible says that you and I are kings to reign here on the earth. I've deliberately left out the priest thing because we all know. Revelations 1, 6, Revelations 5, 10. We are kings and God has called us here to reign on the earth. Isaiah 2 um, and I think Daniel, I think chapter 11. The, if you read towards the end of that chapter, it begins to talk about the mountain of the Lord's house reigning on top of other mountains, even somewhere in the book, I believe it's the book of either Amos, chapter 4, speaking of the mountain of the Lord's house in the last day. The Bible says that one day it, to the Lord is the same as a thousand days, and a thousand days are the same as one day. David writes that, and one of, I think it's Peter who repeats it, either Peter or, I forget, either Peter or James, repeats that same statement. So when the Bible says, talks of, in the last day, some of you are beginning to think in terms of weeks and days, the way we understand them, but there is such a thing as the last day of the king, um, I mean of the way the world we know it. And the Bible says that in that last day in which we are actually already in, how do I know that? In Acts, the apostles say that in the last day, according to Joel chapter 2, that the Lord will pour out his spirit upon all flesh. And when the Holy Spirit came down in an outpouring, Peter announced that we had entered into that last day. So we are in the last days of the last day, if I can so put it. It's been 2,000 years since that pronouncement. So we can comfortably say that those scriptures that refer to the mountain of the Lord's house, sitting on top of other mountains, we live in those days. And it is the kings who sit on top of those mountains. I am reminded of Caleb who tells Joshua when he, they had fought up to a point of entry, and he tells Joshua, give me my mountain, which was promised unto me, which the Lord promised unto me, that I may go in and take it. Mountains are given, but mountains are also taken. And it takes kings, or people who understand the kingly anointing, or the kingly functions, to take mountains. So I needed to lay that foundation before we proceed from where we stopped. So last Sunday, we read Ecclesiastes 9 and Ecclesiastes 10. For those that attended the first service, we read through those entire portions of Scripture and uh, we started sharing from those portions of Scripture the Word of God. And we shared in Ecclesiastes 9, 11, which says, And I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happen to them all. We together saw that the first imperative is that it is important that you are swift. It is important that you are strong because naturally and the order of nature is that the race is always to the swift. You try running with, um, it's not Kiprotich, the guy that won the, the world records twice this year, Kip Chiptegei. Try running after Chiptegei and see what happens, whether when you're not swift you will win that race. So Solomon was not actually discrediting swiftness. He was actually highlighting that swiftness is important. He was highlighting that strength is important. He was highlighting that wisdom is important if you're going to put bread on the table. He was actually also highlighting that understanding creates wealth. Understanding creates wealth. He was also saying that skill brings favor. Skill brings favor. The Bible somewhere says that your gift will make space for you. Your gift will open doors for you. 
your gifting is really about skill. So when you develop skill, there is a way in which it gives you favor. I have been in the corporate management space for over 20 years now, but I can tell you that when I'm hiring for people, I will look for skill and competency. It doesn't matter who you are when it comes to delivering certain things, skill and competency will open doors for you. I have been in places where men and women of skill, their skill and competency has gone ahead of them. And people come and tell you, you really need to hire this person because they are skilled at what they do. They are competent at what they do. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. So the first imperative that Solomon brings to our attention is that it is important to be swift. It is important to be strong. It is important to be wise. It is important to have understanding. It is important to have skill. But let me tell you something about each and every one of those things that I've highlighted above. It takes training to get to the best that you can ever be in any of those things. It takes investment. You need to train. You need to invest of yourself, of your time, of your money. I am yet to see a person who is on top of speed, on top of strength, on top of competency that has not trained. Many of us know Arnold Schwarzenegger that he did. But he was first a bodybuilder and that opened space for him in Hollywood. But the reason why he became, went top of the range, he trained. He used to do bodybuilding every day. The other day we were having a meeting with some of the leaders and Pastor Robert was telling us when he was getting himself back into the fitness thing, running up around the field once was a problem. After the first time, he felt like somebody had put a, a charcoal stove in his chest, you know. But now he can do it a number of laps. Why? Because after a while, when you train, you build speed, you build skill, you build strength, you build competency, you build understanding, and you are able to garner all these things that Solomon is talking about. So he's not discrediting them. And that's the first imperative that I raised last Sunday. As a leader, exercise yourself to these things. Because if you don't, even the very basics of leadership, you cannot even start on it. That's the first imperative. Then the second imperative is, that, is in that very same verse that we saw last Sunday. That time and chance happens to them all. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, there is 1,000 copies of you out there. People who have the same speed, who have the same skill, who have the same competency, who have the same wisdom, the same understanding. So what makes the distinction for you? And this is where Solomon now begins to break out and say that there is such a thing as time and chance and the biggest problem that I have seen in the church is that the church does not understand the principle of time and chance and many many people in the church have not taken time to build what is called emotional intelligence let me give you an example emotional intelligence means that when you're in a place you don't know everyone in that place so you take time to build relationships because you do not know who will be your next bridge or your next connector to the next place. And many people in the church, in the name of being spiritual and hiding behind the Holy Ghost, have discarded emotional intelligence. They don't greet anyone. They don't build relationships with anyone. They simply walk away. They abuse the relationships that God brings into their space. My wife and I have, have been having a series of conversations over a certain issue that we're trying to solve. But then you think about this. The number of times we've gone out to help men and women of God to become something better. And you invest your hard-earned money into something and somebody abuses it. And they think you'll never find out. Emotional intelligence. 
time and chance presents herself among the people that the Lord brings into our space. The reason why some people who are not even born again are able to build empires because they have mastered the principle of time and chance. There are some people who come into your life and they're going to cross through that place once and never again. Last Sunday when we discussed, we learned that there are certain gates and opportunities that affect your generations after you that are going to open once and that once is going to be in your lifetime. But it has a potential of affecting all your generations after you. Time and chance. The question is, when time and chance happens to you, are you awake or are you sleeping? Are you present or are you absent? Are you participating or you're not? And many times you will only know that it was time and chance when it has gone. But the question is that when that happens to you, will you be on the bus or off the bus? Time and chance happens to them all. That was the second imperative that we saw last Sunday. The third one, when you read in Ecclesiastes 9, he talks of a poor man. He talks of a city that was attacked. And the Bible says that small city was attacked by a great king. Let me tell you something about the challenges of life and something that the Lord has been speaking to us as a church since this lockdown began. That we will be confronted by giants because those that are called by God, the only things that get confronted or they get confronted by is giants. So this small city is attacked by a great king according to the Bible. And the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 9.15 that there was found in that small city a poor wise man. He was poor, but he was wise. He was poor, but he was wise. And it says that and he who poor and wise man by his wisdom delivered the city. But there is a sad conclusion. So there is two things in that verse. The poor and wise man was able to contend by his wisdom against a great king. That's where the third imperative comes from. That wisdom is greater than strength. That is what he concludes in verse 16 if you read. Wisdom is greater than strength. There are many challenges that confront us, children of God, that we should have no business trying to exert strength against them. But rather, application of wisdom. Wisdom is greater than strength. If you're going to be a king that reigns on this earth, then you need to seek wisdom. You need to seek wisdom because it is greater than strength. Wisdom is going to cause you to confront mighty kings and you will overcome. Not because you are strong, not because you are mighty, but because you are wise. I gave you examples about that which I don't want to get into today. But the story of the poor wise man ends in a funny way. It says, yet no man remembered the same poor man. Verse 16, wisdom is better than strength. Nevertheless, the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are not heard. So we saw the fourth imperative at that point that money will bring honor. Wealth will bring honor. Glory, earthly glory will bring honor. I grew up in a, in a household and in a home that had some of the original balokole that we knew in Uganda called the Bazukufu. My grandmother was a Muzukufu and a number of them in that household were Bazukufu. My Senga was a Muzukufu. So the whole thing of being a Mulokole was major. But not just a Mulokole, it was being a Muzukufu. But you know, 
The bazooka for all those days, they used to believe that money was a sin. They used to believe that it was an evil thing. They misinterpreted a verse in the Bible which says that the love of money is the root of all evil. And they said money is the root of all evil. Therefore, money, evil. So money is sin. But you see, sometime around the year 2000, when I was, not, not even in the year 2000, it was about 1998, the Lord began to open my eyes about a secret. And this is the statement that the Lord told me, that he that controls the money controls the nation. That is in 1998. And I started to pray in that year. I remember we had a number of prayer partners, and I told them, guys, this is what I hear the Lord say. We need to pray that the children of God take over the financial aspect of this country. Because unless we are in control of the finances, there is no way we will influence the events in the nation. Let me tell you something. That was true then. It was true in the days of Solomon. It is true even now in the days that we live in. Money is so important in terms of power and influence. Some of the biggest problems we have have been introduced by men who never speak a simple word or even a single word. You never hear their voice, but their pocket speaks. And they send people into the houses of representation. They send people into parliament. I'm reminded of Nicodemus, who the Bible says he was a, poor, he was a wise guy, a leader among the Jews, who approached Jesus at night, in the deep of the night. And he had his own questions, and he said, Master, what can I do? But it was in the deep of the night. No one knew that Nicodemus and Jesus were talking. Men and women with money have created problems in nations. Why? You never hear their voice speak, but you see the actions of their pockets. Money is important. Money brings honor. Men and women of money who have learned that secret, no one ever touches them because money is power. It is an imperative of power and influence. It is an imperative of power and influence. Money opens doors. If you wanted to make an appointment, and I will say this here and now, if the president had to, to make a decision between seeing a man who is poor and a man who is wealthy on an appointment schedule concerning matters of the nation, I assure you, the rich man will be ahead on the schedule than the poor man. Because money is influence. There are things I can't even stand up here and talk about of what money has done and of what money can do in terms of steering decisions. Because money is one of the imperatives of anyone that must understand power and influence. You cannot underestimate the power of money. So it is important that if you are going to have a voice, and if you're going to have a voice of influence, then you need money. Better still, as much of it of your own as you can. Because when it is in your pocket, you can decide what to do with it. If I ask the evangelists in the house tonight, are you able to do evangelism without money? Yes, you can. You can do person-to-person -person evangelism. But after a while, even person-to-person -person evangelism needs katunda. It needs water, and that costs money to buy. It needs shoes. Because your shoes will wear out. You need money to do that. But if you're going to do even evangelism at a crusade kind of level, you need money. One of the imperatives of power and influence is money because money speaks. A poor man's wisdom is despised. I don't intend to say this 
just to make some of us look bad. It is what scripture says. So if I were you and this kind of scripture offends me, you know what I would do? I would go down and say, Lord, you want me to influence my people? You want me to be a man or a woman of wisdom and influence? Give me money. Because a poor man's wisdom is despised. There was a man somewhere in this city that I don't want to talk about. But it is said that whenever there was issues on the village, maybe you have a death or you have a party or you, the way you know the way we do things in Uganda, people contribute to events. And they say that this guy, he showed up in those preparatory meetings for five minutes. He always came late. He showed up for five minutes. But when he showed up, his simple question was, what is the need? Okay, we have this. This is the budget. And he says, okay, I have given uh, four million. And the budget is four and a half million. And the people have so far collected 200,000. And he gives four million and he walks away. That is the power of money. Because money, according to the latter part of these chapters that we read, it answers all things. And then the last imperative we saw is that wisdom is better than weapons. They were able to overcome a strong and mighty king without weapons, but with wisdom. Let he who doesn't have wisdom ask, and the Lord who gives liberally shall give. That is one of the ways in which we acquire wisdom. Go back and read your Proverbs very carefully. Look out only for places where it is talking about wisdom. You will begin to understand that, by the way, other than the fact that God gives wisdom, you cannot have wisdom less knowledge. So knowledge is a key factor in wisdom. Today, we continue into the sixth imperative. Ecclesiastes 10. Ecclesiastes 10. I'm going to read some of those verses again for purposes of impact. Verse 1. Dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking sever. So does a little folly <clears throat> to whom who is in reputation for wisdom and honor. A wise man's heart is at his right hand but a fool's heart is at his left. Yes, also when he who is a fool walks by the way, his wisdom fails him, and he says to everyone that he is a fool. If the spirit of the ruler rise up against you, leave not your place, for yielding pacifies great offenses. There is an evil which I have seen under the sun as an error which proceeds from the ruler. Folly is set in great dignity and the rich sit in low places. I have seen servants upon horses and princes walking as servants upon the earth. Hallelujah. Verse 1 says, Dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking Sever, so does a little folly him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. Him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. Him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. In other words, you are known as a man or a woman of wisdom. But here in the verse... He raises one thing that can cause you in a flash to go out. He calls it dead flies. Jesus, when the Pharisees got defeated by the wisdom that he was dispensing with every question that they were asking him, and the miracles he was performing, they said, he is doing these things by Beelzebub. Beelzebub 
is called Lord of the Flies. Now you begin to get the point. He does this by Beelzebub. He does this by the Lord of the Flies. And the Lord of the Flies in simple interpretation for those of you who are not getting it yet is Satan himself. So even among the Jewish culture, flies are associated with the satanic and the demonic. So with that understanding, we're talking about imperatives of power and influence. The verse says, dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary. Simple language, perfume. Apothecarists are people who make perfumes out of natural things. The perfume is implicit and ointment as well is implicit of the Holy Spirit. And of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So if you're talking about perfume in scripture, you are talking about a person who is filled with the Holy Spirit and it, they're, they're oozing out the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So in other words, if we reread this verse with those understanding, we are saying <clears throat> that the path of Satan will cause your anointing to go bad. The sixth imperative is guard your anointing. Guard your anointing. What? Guard the anointing, yes. Because you can lose it. You can lose it. If you keep allowing flies to land upon your apothecary, upon your perfume. <clears throat> what sort of environment are you creating for yourself? I am not talking about kings in the house of God. The kind of kings that God is looking to deploy and use. There is an anointing upon your life. I shared with you Exodus 31. Go and read up a guy called, um, what's that guy's name? I've been mentioning that guy, the wise guy who could work things of, of iron. Bezalel, thank you very much. It took an anointing upon the life of Bezalel to cause the working of iron, to cause the working of gold, to cause a stone that looked ugly to transform into a nice statue that people would look at and get amazed. It takes an anointing to execute the things that God has called you to do. And let me tell you something. The gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. The anointing as well is a gift from God. He gives it to you. In fact, there are people in scripture who the Bible says they came from their mother's wombs with an anointing. For example, John the Baptist. So he did nothing to earn it. Just like you do nothing to become a prophet, to become an apostle, to become a teacher. It's a gift of God. The same thing, the kingly anointing for you to stand in your kingly place that God has called you to do, for you to take that mountain that God has called you to do, it is a gift. It is a perfume. And that is why a person who operates in their anointing, they attract people. Because it is a sweet perfume. It is like worship. The Bible says that Yahweh inhabits the praises of his people. When we begin to worship the Lord, it brings him down. It attracts him. Not that he has left, but there is that place called the secret place of the Most High. It is things like worship that rise up like sweet perfume that begin to draw that presence in our lives. Now, when God has called you as a king in something that you need to fulfill in life, there is an anointing he places on your life. 
And that is why David writes and says, touch not the anointed of the Lord. You know who he was referring to? Fallen King Saul. Because David knew that even in his status of falling, he could not continue a day in kingship when the hand of the Lord was withdrawn from him. There was an anointing of kingship of Saul that even when he fell, the Lord never withdrew it. But you know what happens? Every time you allow flies to come in your environment, you know, what are those undesirable things? Things that cause you to be perverted. Things that cause you to be defiled in your life. It might be in your mind. It might be the kind of company you keep. It might be the kind of things you consume for your soul. Because the Bible says the eye is the window to, to the soul. It might be the kind of things you're consuming through your eye. It might be the kind of things you're hearing. The kind of company you are keeping. Is it the kind of company that is drawing flies along with it? The Bible says that flies, if there is one thing that destroys the anointing, it is dead flies. It will turn that sweet perfume smell that has been upon your life and it will become as a stinking ointment. Many are called. And there's people who choose to, to keep a blind eye. They think, yeah, Naitiwa, I have a calling on my life. I have an anointing on your life. Who argued against that? No one argued against it. I have told you here before, <clears throat> some time back, when we were still younger in Seguku, there was a young boy of eight who laid hands on a blind woman and she saw. A blind woman and she saw that guy had an anointing of healing upon his life he grew a bit older he became arrogant it is even said that that guy that anointing on his life opened up doors of kings for him that the president of Zambia used to send his presidential jet here to pick him and take him but you know what? The guy lived the life of a devil when he was here. When he thought, I still lay hands on people and they recover so I can go and sleep with everyone that I want. And that was his, actually his tendon. He slept with anything that passed in his cut. And that is one of the biggest problems we have had in the church. You have homosexual pastors, but they still stand up on the pulpit and they minister in power. Why? Because the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance okay but at some point that anointing becomes as a stinking flavor that is what this verse says the day you begin opening up your door to flies watch out the flies guys watch out for the flies watch out for the flies watch out be very careful about creating demonic environments around yourself one of the imperatives of a leader is that they guard the anointing on their lives. They guard the anointing on their lives. Because it can go and none of us will ever know that it has gone. But your anointing will become a stinking, what does, it, what does the Bible say here? It says it becomes a stinking server. What causes perfume to change from that nice smell to a stink is that there is dead flies in there. Do you have dead flies? Are you guarding the anointing? Because you see, one of the ways you prevent dead flies from landing in this anointing is that you keep the bottle sealed. You keep watching the environment. You keep a clean environment around it. I am yet to see a fly that flies around a clean environment. If you find it, it is a subject for research. I want to know. Dead flies. <clears throat> they will turn anointing into a stinking server. 
So the sixth imperative, if we are going to reign as kings, is we must guard the anointing. It doesn't matter how many years you have grossed up in wisdom, but the day you open up that door to the demonic and to weird stuff, your anointing becomes as a stinking server. Your reputation for wisdom. Here it says just a little folly, just a little compromise, just a little compromise. I have seen brothers and sisters who are in places maybe of influence. They just take a little money, just a little folly. You compromise yourself a bit. You know? You're a sister, you have an anointing on, on, your, on your life. It doesn't seem like in the house of God any man is saying anything. And then a certain haji comes, just a little folly. Just a little. Just a little folly. That's what the Bible says. What kind of folly are you keeping around your life? Because that kind of stuff does not make for kings does not make for power and influence. So watch. Watch it, guys. Watch it. Guard the anointing on your life. Hallelujah. Then the second verse, it says something that most of us possibly missed. Verse 2, it says, A wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart is at his left. Show me your right hand. Let me see. Lift up your right hand quickly. Let me see people who don't know right from left. Okay, all of us seem to know. Now you have to go back to some of the things we have talked about in previous teachings to understand what this verse is saying. The Bible says... As you come out of the Holy of Holies. Now I'm going back to the teaching about the temple of God. As you come out of the Holy of Holies and enter into the holy place. There is two critical items that we've talked about that sit in the holy place. On the right hand side, what do we have? The seven golden lampstands. And on the left hand side, what do we have? The table of the shoe bread. The word and the power. The word and the Holy Spirit. I want us to begin putting things in perspective. Okay? Food and grace. Okay? Left and right. I want you to begin putting things in perspective. I'm just drawing to you the imageries and the implications of right hand and left hand. From the Holy of Holies, you enter into the holy place, you begin to understand the definition of left and right, north and south. Okay? North and south. Food and oil. Word and power. You know? The arm of flesh, the power of the Holy Ghost. Do you get the image I'm painting? What does it say? It says, A wise man's heart. A what? A wise man's heart. It says, Is at where? At his right hand. A fool's heart is at his left. The Bible says, Cast is he that trusts in the arm of flesh. You want to be wise, guys? Let me tell you a story. A friend of mine in the last elections went out campaigning in uh, one of the constituencies in Kampala. They entered into a place similar to, you know, walking through Kawempe. They find two men this friend was with, with some of the campaign people she was working with. And these men tell her, you want to win? 
You have to do like the rest have done. You have to sacrifice. For us, we are ready to take you where you do this sacrifice. And she told them that for me, I have already paid, my sacrifice was paid by Jesus Christ. She told me, and I wasn't the only one when she said these words, that when she said that, the man told her, okay, let your Jesus help you. And immediately she blacked out. When she got back into consciousness, many, many minutes later, her people had lifted her back into her car. Now, there's a moral to that story. It is not a story. It is something that happened in Nakawa five years ago. The foolish men and women have put their heart on their left hand. They have gone to the witch doctors and they have paid every manner of sacrifice, including human sacrifices, to get what they get. Now, some of these things people will ask me for evidence. It is public secret, public knowledge. It is all there. Some of the rich men in the city, they have paid human sacrifices from the stories written in the press after thorough investigations. Some of the men and women in power, in mighty offices, have paid for them with their hearts on the left-hand side. They have trusted in the arm of flesh. Now, some people in the church have interpreted that verse to mean that as children of God, we should spend our time in the sanctuary praying and fasting and waiting on God and waiting for God to go among the constituents campaigning for us and eventually also casting the vote for us. And that is where the foolishness of the church sometimes is. People don't even have voter cards, but they expect the things to change just on the knees alone. Now, that's a misunderstanding of the scriptures. But I'm just demonstrating something that a wise man's heart, according to this, is on the right-hand side, on the side of the Holy Ghost, on the side of the anointing that breaks the yoke of bondage. That is where a wise man's heart is, on the side of the power of God rather than trusting in the arm of flesh. It has been said severally, there are many women that have made it. Please forgive me. I have met many excellent women in the corporate workplace. I have many women that I can list that I honestly respect professionally. But the, it has also been said, many women have paid for the positions on the altar of fornication. The heart is on the left. Many men have paid for wealth by stealing from people. You execute a deal, you agree terms with somebody, and when the deal comes through, you never meet your, your side of the bargain because you think everything belongs to me. You never apportion the wealth that belongs to somebody else because you believe in the arm of flesh. You don't believe that this that you have, the Lord can bless. My wife and I, some of the things that the Lord has given to us, it's not because we were very wealthy. And I learned a lesson after some time that it doesn't help to try and struggle to make things work just by your own self. Because I observed and I compared the effort I had put in in a certain part of my life and how much I had garnered from that and how the Lord had blessed me in a different side and I decided that it is the Lord that blesses. It is better to have that which the Lord has blessed. A wise man's heart is on the right hand side a foolish man's heart is on the left where is your decision making going to lie imperatives of power and influence sometimes 
men are going to walk all over you on this journey to power and influence and you've got to decide whether you're going to fight them in the way that you know how to fight or you're going to wait for the oracles of God and the instruction from the heavenlies for you to take the next move in one of the jobs that I did I was so despised by somebody who was supervising me and I wanted to get up and fight because I knew how to fight and just as I was planning to do it the Lord told me don't do it and I said what I thought you told us to influence he said don't do it now I'm just telling you this is not I'm not telling you that every time people walk all over you you shouldn't stand up for yourself no you need to be attentive to what the Holy Spirit is saying that is what I'm saying you need the guidance of the Holy Spirit that's what I'm saying for a wise man's heart is on the right and a foolish man's heart is on the left follow the Holy Spirit that is the seventh imperative follow the Holy Spirit because the left hand is the arm of flesh follow the Holy Spirit you know we might want to run through these imperatives it's just not possible for us to do it I thought I could but we've run out of time it's more important that we learn but as I conclude we go through so many battles in life let me conclude with this story there is a pastor that I worked with in the National Fellowship for Born Again Pentecostal churches I forget her name but she told us a story before she got born again she got married and uh, they had a very bad marriage um, she and her husband used to fight they eventually they were not seeing eye to eye then about I think she says the 15th year of their marriage she got born again and she started going deep into God but the marriage wasn't getting better it kept it actually got worse and she says one day she decided she was gonna pursue God so she kept going to church she used to go to to trumpet center and then her husband objected she told her one day decide whether it's me or God or the church and she told the man it's quite obvious if I have to choose between you and God and the church I have made my choice already and she says she turned to go back into her prayer room and the husband left the house to go to work and God told her you're not going to pray go back and tell her you're going to tell him you're going to listen to him he said what she tried to pray well there was nothing the heavens were not opening the Holy Spirit said go and tell him you are sorry for what you said and that you're going to listen to him so she gathered her small things went to the man's office sat down there waited at the reception they tell her the man is in a meeting she said I will wait the man comes she says I want to see he says no 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 I'm in a meeting he says I want to see you he says I am very busy the woman knelt down right there at the reception she said I am sorry for what I said in the morning I am going to listen to you the guy said are you sure <laughs> he said go back home and wait for me what follows because we've run out of time is a story of obedience eventually what happens the woman went back and literally listened to the man to the extent of escorting him when he was going to drink in the bar because he said I want you to go with me and he would order his beer and she would order her juice and her soda and he would get drunk she would carry him and they go back home together that man got born again eventually how did it begin 
he started telling her, you no longer go to church. She said, you stopped me from going. He said, I will drive you there. He drove her to the church. He would drop her, come back and wait for her. However long she took, he waited. Then he started saying, but you used to take money to give into these church things you people do. He said, but I don't have any money. He started giving her money to give to missions and offerings. A wise man's heart is on the right. A foolish man's heart is on the left. Let's pray. Father, we bless your name. Thank you for your word says that the entry of your word brings light. Bring light in our hearts this morning. As we continue to study about the imperatives of power and influence, bring light in our hearts. Holy Spirit, teach us your way and bless us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen and amen. <laughs>